Today we're going to be looking at another one of Veritasium's videos. Specifically, this single rule underpins all of physics. That ds equals zero. So that whole thing about speed of light traveling the shortest path. At least that's what I think. Anyway. Those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check this out. This is a video about a single simple rule that underpins all of physics. Every principle from classical mechanics to electromagnetism from quantum theory to general relativity, right? Okay, he's cro it's like he's simplifying it. Okay. Down to the ultimate constituents of matter, the fundamental particles. All of it can be replaced by this single rule. Feels like we're approaching spooky territory. <laughs> we're approaching spooky territory, I hear you, and I agree. It may in fact explain the behavior of life itself. I think I'm stuck in some classical mindset where to me, the local picture, the differential okay. equation way of thinking I think about this is the where universe, it's going. that that's really what's going on. But I fear that I have it exactly backwards. Hmm. And it all starts with a simple problem. If you want to slide a mass from point A to point B, what shape of ramp will get it there the fastest? Oh, I've heard of this. This is known as the problem of fastest descent. You know, common sense, you might say, take the shortest path. <laughs> straight, straight line from line. A to B. But if you bend the ramp down a bit at the beginning, well, the mass accelerates to a higher speed earlier. So even though it travels slightly farther, it travels faster and beats the straight ramp. This concept sort of shows up in nuclear engineering, except it's the opposite. You're trying to slow down neutrons in the reactor. And it's not the shortest distance. It's It could be an indirect route through whatever slows you down the fastest. It can be an indirect energy optimizing pass through water in a light water reactor to slow it down. Or graphite if you're doing a reactor that's closer to Chernobyl. And the reason why you want to slow them down is neutrons need to be going at a certain speed in order to fission, assuming you're fissioning something like uranium-235 or uranium-233 if you're going for a thorium-based fuel cycle. But if you're going too fast, you're not going to cause fission. So that's why there's a similar amount of optimization that goes on. So the question is, what shape provides the perfect balance of acceleration and path length to minimize travel time? According to Galileo, it was the arc of a circle. Perfect circle. He showed that this is faster than any polygon. But is it the fastest? Nearly 60 years later, in June of... Circle's kind of hard to pull off realistically, a, a truly perfect one. 1696, Johann Bernoulli set this problem as a challenge to the best mathematicians in the world. Mainly because he's a big show-off, and he wants to show that he's better than all of them. <laughs> he gave right. everyone six months to come up with solutions, but none were submitted. So Gottfried Leibniz, a friend of Bernoulli's, persuaded him to extend the deadline to give foreigners a chance. And I think Newton was probably the intended target because everybody thought of him as the best. And so Johann would have wanted to show that he was better than Newton. He was um, no longer really active mathematician. Scientist, mathematician, I guess you could say natural philosopher for back then. Pissing contest, really. Or physicist, he was working as the warden of the mint, like a big high government position. And on the 29th of January, 1697, Newton returned home after a long day at work to find Bernoulli's challenge in the mail. Irritated, he wrote, I do not love to be dunned and teased by foreigners about mathematical dunned things. Dunned and teased. But the problem was too enticing. So Newton spent the rest of the day and night on it. And by 4 a.m., he had come up with a solution, something that took Bernoulli two weeks. Newton submitted his solution to the journal Philosophical Transactions. He sent his solution there but didn't sign it. And Johann Bernoulli, after seeing the solution, is alleged to have said, I recognize the lion by his claw. Mm -hmm. You know, that... Sounds like him. Okay, you don't need to sign it, Newton. I can tell who you are. Who else could give such a solution? 
And while overall Newton dominated Bernoulli, in this instance Bernoulli's solution actually outshone Newton's. I could see why Johann Bernoulli wanted to challenge everybody because he came up with a, a really clever, I would say like a truly creative, beautiful solution. To do it, he took inspiration from a problem faced by ancient philosophers. How does light travel from one place to another? Okay. This was contemplated by Hero of Alexandria in the first century AD. He realized that in a I single medium like spell. air, light always follows the shortest path. A consequence is that when light reflects, say, off a lake, the angle of incidence is always equal to the angle of reflection. Any other path between the start and end points would be longer. But when light goes from one medium into another, like from air into water, it bends in a peculiar way, it, it refracts, and it doesn't follow the shortest path. If you've ever dropped something at the bottom, it slows down. In fact, the blue glow you see from nuclear reactors is the result of particles actually going faster than light in the medium. The rule is you can't go faster than C or the speed of light in a vacuum. Didn't say anything about going faster than light in the medium. So you can kind of cheat that rule a bit. ...of a swimming pool, and you look for it through the water. If you put your hand in there, it's not necessarily where you think it is because the light yeah. has bent away from the flat surface. So Size what is the, is the guiding too. principle here? Well, over the next 1600 years, people slowly <laughs> figured out that the sine of the angle of incidence divided by the sine of the angle of refraction is equal to a constant, n, which depends on the nature of the two media. This came to be known as Snell's Law, but no one knew why it worked. That is, until 1657. So another great mathematician enters our... It's crazy how people have been thinking about that for 1,600 years and still haven't figured that out. Is nuclear fusion going to take 1,600 years? Oh, I hope not. Story at this point, this is Pierre Fermat. By day, he was a judge, but at night he'd come home and hang out with his wife and kids and then do what he really loved the most, which was work on math for fun. And he mostly worked that's, in pure math. But at one point, he got interested in the question of why does light obey this principle of refraction? And he thought maybe Hero of Alexandria was on the right track. And they didn't have all those fun lasers to play with back then either. But it's not distance that is being minimized, but rather time. But to see if this was true for refraction would be difficult. He would have to work out every possible path light could take by varying the point where it intersects the boundary and compute the time for each, and then show that light takes the path for which the total travel time is the shortest. Good luck doing that back then. He doesn't then. know how to solve it, and he worries that he's, it's going to come out complicated even if he could solve it, so he's not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because he wasn't super interested in physics, actually. But <laughs> anyway, funny. years go by. He gets interested in it five years later and tries to solve it, and then he does solve it, and he shows that Snell's law actually pops out as the minimizing path for light you know, under these conditions of moving from one medium with one speed of light to another with another. And that constant n? Well, that's just equal to the speed of light in the first medium divided by the speed of light in the second medium, which allows us to rewrite Snell's law like this. That's the way I'm used to seeing it as. Another elegant, simple example, like they said. And he says this thing, I just want to read you a little quote because I love it. He says that this is the most extraordinary, the most unforeseen, and the happiest calculation of his life. See, it's good to do physics. Happiest calculation. <laughs> <laughs> if you use that principle of least time, you can explain everything that was known about light at the time of Fermat. It's the first time, as far as I know, that anyone shows that nature obeys an optimization principle that nature does the best possible thing. <laughs> In this case, that light takes the shortest possible time. That's interesting. Now, Bernoulli knew about Fermat's principle of least time, and he thought he could use it to solve the problem of fastest descent. He converted the problem from a mechanics problem about a particle sliding down a chute to a problem about optics. Instead of a mass that's accelerated by gravity, he imagined a ray of light that would go faster and faster as it went into layers of less and less dense media. 
and if you make the layers thinner That's... and thinner, where Snell's law is obeyed at each interface, you eventually get a continuous curve. Cool. Now the question is, how should the speed of light change from one layer? See, I never would have thought of connecting those two, but I guess maybe that's one of the differences between physicists and engineers. ...to the next, so that it accurately models a falling object. You could try to solve the problem by thinking if the particle has to fall from A to B, it's going to be picking up kinetic energy. It's going faster and faster as it slides down the chute, and it's converting the loss in potential energy into this kinetic energy. If you write down the conservation of energy for that relationship, you find that mm -hmm. the velocity that the particle achieves at any time, having fallen a distance, let's say y, its velocity squared will be proportional to y, the height from the top. So velocity True. goes like the square root of y. And that'd be sort of like saying, imagine light moving in a way where instead of a constant speed of light, the speed of light is proportional to the distance from the top. Now let's zoom in and look at a single interface. We can plug in our expression for the speed of light in each layer into Snell's law. Then you find that the sine of the first angle, divided by the square root of y for the first layer, is equal to the sine of the second angle, divided by the square root of y for the second layer. And now here's the key insight. Snell's law also holds for the next layer. And there the ingoing angle is simply theta 2. So this is also equal to the sine of the third angle divided by the square root of y3. And the same goes for the next layer, and, so on, and the so next, forth. and so on. In other words, this ratio must be equal to some constant, call it k. And this equation, the story goes, Bernoulli immediately recognized as the equation of a cycloid. That is the path traced out by a point attached to the rim of a rolling wheel. This is also known as a brachistochrone curve, huh. from the Greek for shortest time. This kind of goes back to, makes me think of neutrons again and that the quickest path is still not the straight line, or quickest being the optimal way to slow them down. This is, this is cool. And so the astonishing solution is that the fastest way to get from A to B is to follow an arc of a cycloid, not a circle, a shape called a cycloid. Now this curve also has another surprising property. No matter where I release the mass from, it always reaches the end at the same time. For this reason, it's also known as the totochrone curve, from the Greek for same time. That's cool. Upon finding this solution, Bernoulli wrote, Yeah, because I guess as you go higher up, you'd have more of that potential energy to get you going from the gravity. Okay. That kind of reminds me of if you were to tunnel through the Earth, it would take something like 40 minutes regardless of what points you go through because of the different intensity, because of the different points of the Earth where gravity is stronger or weaker. Now that's an approximation. I mean, the Earth's not like a perfect sphere or anything, so it probably varies a little bit, but it, you'd get pretty close. That's fascinating. In this way, I have solved at one stroke two important problems an optical and a mechanical one, and have achieved more than I demanded from others. I have shown that the two problems taken from entirely separate fields of mathematics have the same the character. Same character. <laughs> Little did Bernoulli know, he was onto something much bigger. Unified field theory. Around 40 years later, one of his students, Pierre-Louis de Maupertuis, also studied the behavior of light and particles. And he noticed that there are cases where the two behave very similarly. This made him think, what if Fermat's principle of least time wasn't the most fundamental? I mean, why should nature care about minimizing time? Maybe there is a more foundational quantity being minimized, one that doesn't only govern light, but also particles. So in the 1740s, he proposed a new quantity, which he called the action. It is mass times velocity times distance. His thinking went something like this. Hmm. The farther something travels, the greater the action. The faster it goes, the greater the action. And if it's a particle, sure. then the more massive it is, the greater the action. If there are multiple segments to the journey, then the total action is just the sum of the mass times velocity times distance for each segment. To see the principle in action, here is a yeah, super simple action. example with no friction or losses. Imagine a 0.5 kilogram ball is rolled over the ground for 6 meters at 3 meters per second. Then that would be 9 units of action. 
if the ball then bounces and travels. Kilograms meters squared per second. So angular momentum. Interesting. Travels another six meters at three meters per second. Then the action for the whole trip is nine plus nine or 18 units of action. Now, what Maupertuis claimed is that out of all possible trajectories where the ball bounces off the wall, the path it will follow is the one that minimizes the action. In 1744, he wrote, this action is the true- I've never heard it expressed as action though. And I know it's just the same dimensions, but still. Expense of nature, which she manages to make as small as possible. That's so what was the response to Maupertuis's revolutionary idea? He was attacked and ridiculed. Sounds about right. One of his longtime friends, a fellow physicist named Samuel Koenig, wrote that not only is your principle wrong, you also stole it from Leibniz. Voltaire, who used to be so a close friend wrong. of Maupertuis, accused him of plagiarism, bad physics, being stupid, and just about being anything stupid. else you could think of. In fact, he wrote a 32-page pamphlet just to mock Maupertuis. Of course, this may wow. have been partly due to rumors Voltaire's lover had an affair with Maupertuis. But not everyone attacked him. Some just ignored him. Maupertuis. I've taken a lot of math and physics in my life. I think you're the first person I ever heard pronounce it. He doesn't get much mention. All of this was terribly stressful for Maupertuis, who was nearing the end of his life, mm. and more than anything, he thought the principle of least action would be what he was remembered for. That would be his legacy. But now he was attacked, mocked, ridiculed, and ignored. Unfortunately, Sad. this treatment was at least somewhat justified, because Maupertuis came up with his principle by kind of just picking it out of the air. There was no obvious reason why nature should care about mass times velocity times distance, or even less, why that quantity should be minimized. And mathematically, the principle of least action wasn't rigorous either. But there was one man who vehemently defended it, and that man was Leonard Euler. The first thing Euler did was he replaced the sum with an integral. So you could calculate the action while speed or direction changed continuously. Yeah, basically the same thing, except I guess at the previous action summation would have required discrete values. And he used this to find the path of a particle around a central mass, like the orbit of a planet around a star. Solving this meant that out of every possible <laughs> path between two points, he would have to find the one for which the action cool was effect. the smallest. Cool model. This is similar to the problem Fermat tried to solve, only now instead of changing one variable, he would have to vary every possible point along the path, which is infinitely many. Needless to say, this was an arduous task. Yeah, and the lack of computers back then, or I guess the computer back then was someone doing it by hand. Math had not yet developed the tools required to handle such problems. Fortunately, Euler himself invented a new method it was clunky and time-consuming, but it worked. Through this process, he realized that the principle of least action only works if the total energy is conserved, and it is the same for all paths considered. These were two conditions that Maupertuis hadn't realized. Like the speed of light being constant, sure. ...realized were necessary. So Euler improved the mathematical rigor of the principle. He found two extra conditions, and he provided a specific example of it working. Euler is an astonishingly powerful and not just great mathematician, but appears to be a good guy. As far as we could tell, he, he was very generous. You can still read Euler and really understand it. He helps you, he's empathetic. Yeah. You know, he was uh, like you are, man. <laughs> he's trying to explain <laughs> stuff. But Euler was- uh, It's fun seeing, uh, seeing Derek light up after that. Still far from a general proof. That would have to wait for another legendary mathematician, Joseph Louis Lagrange. Joseph Louis Lagrange was a shy 19 year old, mostly self taught. But despite his age, he was already working at the forefront of mathematics, including with Euler's new method. In 1754, he shared his results with Euler, who replied that Lagrange had extolled the theory to the highest summit of perfection, wow. which caused him the greatest joy. 
But besides being world-class mathematicians, the two had another thing in common. They were both huge proponents of the principle of least action. And around five years later, just a year after Maupertuis' death, Lagrange succeeded in providing a general proof. Is there any intuitive way to think about action? <laughs> like, I, I feel like there's an intuitive way to think about force, and there's kind of an intuitive way to think about energy. But is there an intuitive way to think about action? I don't know. I, I want to watch your show to learn. I hope you'll come up with it, because I don't have a good feeling about action. Now, I want to explain Lagrange's proof, yeah, but I don't I want to do it the way he head, did. Sure. So instead, we'll go through three steps. First, we'll explain the general approach Euler and Lagrange came up with. Then we'll rewrite the principle into its modern form. And finally, we'll apply this math to a simple example to show you why it works. So first, the general approach. If there are infinite possible paths, how do you find the one with the least action? Well, Euler and Lagrange realized you can do it in a similar way to how you find the minimum of a function. There, you take the derivative and set it equal to zero. And where the slope is horizontal, that must be the minimum. So if you took a tiny step to the left or the right, the value of the function basically doesn't change. And similarly, if you have the path of least action, then if you were to change it a little bit by, say, adding a tiny bump here or flattening it out there, imagine we're just adding a tiny function eta to our path of least action. It's fascinating to me how calculus can be simplified to either finding slopes of lines or finding areas under curves. Now, granted, said lines and said curves can get multi, multi dimensional and multivariate, so they can get pretty complicated, but. Ultimately, it isn't that complex of a subject if you really think about it. Well, then the action basically shouldn't change because we're at this really special point, the path of least action. You add a little bit to the minimal path, but the action is still the same. If that is the optimal path that has the least action, then any other path must have more action. So the counter there is like all of this is the first order. So if you're looking at linear terms that are proportional to eta, the deviation, then the first order, the difference in action will be zero. And the way you can imagine this is like, let's say you're at the bottom of a bowl and you're at the minimum and you make some tiny step away and we call that step eta. If that change would be proportional to eta, you would maybe increase on this side, but decrease yeah. on this side. And then this would no longer be a it's minimum. Balance. So sort of the coefficient of eta has to be zero. But since you're at a minimum, it kind of goes like a parabola. So it can be proportional to eta squared or potentially some higher Symmetrical. Order. So there is a tiny deviation in the action, uh, but it's not proportional to eta. So to first order, the change in action between the optimal path and some trial path is zero. So what you can write is that the action of this trial path minus the action of the true path is equal to zero to first order. This is a compact way of writing the principle of least action, and it's the general approach and to think the person that came with the word action was to describe this was ridiculed along the way. Which you use to solve all these problems. So with that in hand, let's rewrite the principle into its modern form. Starting with Maupertuis' action, which was the sum of mass times velocity times distance. But Euler changed this into an integral. integral. Yep. So it's the integral of mass times velocity integrated over distance. Now, the velocity is equal to ds over dt, which we can rearrange yep. to get ds equals v dt. And plugging this in, we have an integral of mv squared over time. But wait, that's just twice the kinetic energy. Yeah, kinetic energy. And as Euler pointed out, the total energy must be conserved. Total energy is just kinetic plus potential. So we can rewrite this as t equals e minus v. And filling this in for the second t gives us that the variation of t plus e minus v integrated over time is equal to zero. Now we can split this integral into two, and since the energy is constant, we can integrate this term over time to get this. And we can simplify this even further. Just like with a normal derivative, we can write the variation of e times t as e times the variation of t plus t times the variation of e. 
But remember, as Euler found, the energy of different paths has to be the same. So the variation between them is zero, and this term drops yeah, out. Right. If we rearrange really this stuff. like so, then we find that the variation of this integral is equal to minus the energy times the variation of time. Okay, I really wish I had Veritas when I was taking physics classes. It would have made concepts a lot easier to grasp and put together, not to mention more exciting. This looks a lot like some other minimization principle. If only this was equal to zero. Well, we can make this zero by only considering paths that have the same travel time. If you do that, then yeah, there's no longer any out. variation in time, and this term drops out. And what we find is that Maupertuis principle has changed into another form, where now the variation of kinetic energy minus potential energy integrated over time is equal to zero. T minus V, kinetic energy minus potential energy, and then you integrate that along a path that you're traveling from A to B, and then integrate it with respect to time. It's all very strange, and yet that turns out to be the correct thing to integrate. Now, this is a little weird. We started with mass times velocity yeah. integrated over distance, and now we have the kinetic energy minus the potential energy integrated over time. And somehow both are ways to write the principle. So you're equating, yeah, you're equating distance and time here. That's like a little magic trick. Full of least action. But that also means that this integral here, t minus v integrated over time, is another way to write the action. The first person to write the principle of least action like this was William Rowan Hamilton in 1834. And by doing so, he got the principle named after him. So the principle of least action that we write as integral of L dt, L being the Lagrangian, the T minus V, the kinetic minus potential energy, they don't call it Lagrange's principle, they call it Hamilton's principle. So I guess Hamilton is building on Lagrange in that way. Hamilton's principle... It's always weird how the names and people get credited with all these things. I, I don't know if there was ever any fight over that sort of thing. I'm sure there was, but to me, I just don't fully understand it. ...is the modern way of writing the principle of least action, and the way you'd find it in almost every physics book. In part, that's because Hamilton's principle tells you how objects move from one place to another, yeah, rather than just giving you the shape of the path. Two other important differences between both principles are that the action is now an integral over time instead of space, and a consequence is that with Hamilton's principle, you now need a start and end point, and also a start and end time. The third is that with Maupertuis principle, you this need to really keep cool. the energy of different paths the same, but the time can vary, while with Hamilton's principle... I mean, this is really cool when you look at these, because going back to Maupertuis, I'm sure I butchered that, but it was kind of what we were talking about earlier with optimizing, say, neutron distributions in a reactor core with referring to like the individual particles, momentum, kinetic energy, that sort of stuff. And they're looking at like probability of fission, probability of absorption, scattering angles, that sort of stuff. But something like Hamilton's that integrates over time, that's the one you're going to be looking at for actual operations. Because after all, power generation, you want to optimize over time. You want consistent, stable power output. So the analog to that would be neutron flux, as in neutrons per surface area, per unit time. So you have like a big picture view and you have the goal of, of safe, stable, reliable power. It's cool seeing it evolve over time like this. The energies can differ, but the time has to be the same between paths. So now we have our general approach and the modern way of writing the principle. So let's apply it to a simple example to see why it works. A simply, I guess I used a more complicated example of a nuclear power plant. <laughs> Let's say I throw this ball straight up in the air. So it goes from some start point to, say, a different end point in a certain amount of time. Now, if we call the height of the ball y of t, then we can plot these two points like so. And then we can imagine infinitely many possible trajectories that could connect these two points. Sure. Some go a little higher, some lower, some have wiggles, <laughs> others don't. Wiggles. The only condition is Can that you imagine that if when you just threw a ball up in the air it started wiggling? That, that'd be so weird. All paths must have the same start and end point and the same amount of time elapsed between them. Now to find the real trajectory, we proceed as before. 
We imagine that this is the true path, y of t, the one with the least action, and then we imagine making small variations to it by pushing it up a little here, down a little there, and... I see what you did there, yt and qt, or qt, that's, that's funny. So on, making tiny changes at every time step, which we'll call eta of t. So when you add y and eta together, you get this new trial path, let's call it q of t. And since the variations yep. are small, the difference in action between these two paths is zero. Our next task is to solve this equation. So we compute the action for each path. For this, we need the kinetic and potential energy for each, and we write them as a function of y and eta. Plugging that in, you get the difference in actions is equal to this. But wait, this first integral is just the action of the true path. So these integrals cancel, and what you're left yep. with is just that. The difference. m times dy over dt times d eta over dt minus eta times the derivative of the potential integrated over time is equal to zero. We can rewrite this further by using integration by parts. That allows us to replace well, this term <laughs> with this one. And if we plug that in, we now have some function that when multiplied by eta and integrated over time has to be equal to zero. But since eta can be just about anything, this can only be true if this part is zero. So what we found is that the action is minimal for the path that satisfies this curious differential equation. Now it might look complicated, but it's not. Minus the derivative of the potential is just the force. force. And the second derivative of height, well, that's just acceleration. So if I knew it, F equals MA all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I had a feeling we were going somewhere in this realm. We rearrange this, we find that the path that satisfies the principle of least action is the one that obeys F equals MA. In other words, the principle of least action is equivalent to Newton's second law. But it covers more than just mechanics. Fermat's principle of least time turned out to be nothing more than a special case of the- Oh yeah, more than mechanics, more than gravity, electromagnetism, strong nuclear, weak nuclear. And they're forces, right? <laughs> I mean, particle physics, energy and heat transfer. I mean, yeah, it, you can express the force a little differently than just a little m and a little a, but still, the same general idea. Principle of least action. So with this single principle, you could suddenly describe everything from light reflecting and refracting to the swinging of a pendulum clock, to planets orbiting the sun and stars orbiting the core of the galaxy. What used to be viewed as entirely- It's a good point, yeah, really big things too. I mentioned really small things. <laughs> separate fields of physics were now all unified under a single simple rule. The variation of the action is zero. After Euler found out about Lagrange's proof, he wrote to him, How satisfied would not Mr. Maupertuis be, were he still alive, if he could see his principle of least action I applied know. to the highest degree of dignity to which it is susceptible? So the very idea of light always traveling the same distance in space-time, looking at this ds equals zero, there's implications of causality, so for one event to affect another, it happens close enough in space and time for light to be able to connect them. Even if observers are moving at different speeds or see things from a little bit different perspective. Yeah, it's interesting, it's a fundamental rule. With Lagrange's proof, we now have two ways to solve any mechanics problem. You can either use forces and vectors, or you can use energies and scalars. It seems like the principle of least action is just... That's where the thermodynamics comes in. Energy and scalars, like temperature, for instance. Yeah, that's, that's something. Way too complicated. It is so unnecessary. Who would ever use this, you know, when you could just use Newton's second law? Like, that's a piece of cake. Your options are either use all of this, or just start with F equals MA, and they give you the same answer. Why ever use the principle of least action? Well, I guess you could say it's the least action not to use the principle of least action. That's because Euler and Lagrange came up with a way to make all of this like super, super simple. If this is the action, then T minus V is called the Lagrangian. 
Now let's replace everything we I've did. I've also never seen kinetic energy written as T. Either just one half mv squared or Ke or something like that. Different physics textbooks, I guess. Before with the Lagrangian. Then you see that the principle of least action works whenever this differential equation is satisfied. So all you have to do now, if you want to solve any mechanics problem, is you just write down the kinetic and potential energy and you plug it into this equation and you're done. And that becomes extremely powerful. I remember thinking, man, force is like hard to get the right answer. You can do it if you're good and people who are good at mechanics can do it. But with the Lagrangian approach, you have this machine crank out the principle of yeah. least action on it and you get the right equation to motion and you don't have to be a good physicist. I remember learning stuff like numerical integration, like Simpson's rule in calculus and then having to do it by hand for some reason and I'm not that old we didn't need to just to show and gain appreciation for how algorithms solve things using numerical approximations rather than for things that's too cumbersome to solve quote unquote accurately that was what I took <laughs> from it that as a math guy I can do physics thanks to Lagrange and Euler and it doesn't just work in one dimension. If you have more dimensions, then you just solve the Euler-Lagrange equation for each coordinate. Yeah, more dimensions, just more computer. Another thing that's great is you could use weird coordinate systems that might be better suited to the problem. Like polar. Like if you were doing a problem with something rotating, you might want to use polar coordinates yep. instead of Cartesian coordinates. And this will give you the correct equations of motion in polar coordinates, which again, might be kind of tricky to do with vectors. Like yeah. with the double pendulum. Yes. Trying to solve this using forces is extremely hard. Yeah, that's true. Because as one pendulum is swinging, it provides the attachment point for the pendulum hanging below it. And so that pendulum is in this moving reference frame as it's swinging. It's a very nasty job to write down the correct F equals MA for a double pendulum. But if you write it down with kinetic and potential energy, it's pretty easy. Let me know if any of you attempted to do this in like early physics classes where they go over things like, go for like mechanics, rotating objects, things like this, and decide, eh, I'm just gonna use energy equations. This is actually how we made this simulation. Now, there is one cool. little side note we should give about the principle of least action, because the name is a little misleading. Although we often refer to the principle as the principle of least action, it's probably good to add a little caveat here that sometimes it's not necessarily the minimum. Just as when you find in calculus, when you set a derivative to zero, that doesn't guarantee you're getting the minimum of a function. That's true. The principle of least... Could be a relative minimum, yeah. ...action, more properly stated, should be the principle of stationary action. That the laws of motion come from demanding a stationary point, which is tantamount to this condition of setting a certain derivative to zero and then getting the Euler-Lagrange equation from that. So very often it is a true minimum, but, but not always. But action is much more fundamental than just classical mechanics. This is background music. Around the turn of the 20th century, action popped up as the key part of a solution to one of the biggest problems in atomic physics at the time, the UV catastrophe. It's kind of spooky that um, this breakthrough that starts the ball rolling toward quantum theory brings action in, not energy and not force, action. Uh, gives yeah. you a hint. So as that graph for the UV catastrophe showed, basically there was an old flawed model that predicted that stars, heated objects at high temperature would somehow give off infinite energy at the ultraviolet energy spectrum, which clearly didn't happen, and they knew that. What they're getting at here is, and then what was discovered by Planck was that energy isn't on a continuous spectrum at all. There's discrete packets, which get into the fundamentals of quantum mechanics. And what they're getting at in Leaf's action was, again, back to the principle about nature taking the most efficient, the most balanced path, and this is what it turned out to be. But it's interesting that this has led all the way to quantum mechanics, talking about something that was talked about in the 1600s can lead to the UV model that restricts energy at high frequencies in quantum mechanics. That's, hmm. I don't know if Planck knew he was doing that or if it's more of a coincidence. Either way though, it suggests they're connected. Yeah. But that and much more 
we'll have to wait for a separate video. So make sure you're subscribed to get notified when it comes out. Check it out. That was really interesting. I love stories like this. Thanks so much for the recommendation. And thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.